Hello, I'm Ross Altschuler, the curator of this exhibit, Collecting Jewelry, Curator H.P. Mara's Trip to Navajo Country in 1932. Several years ago, I helped curator Maxine McBrand with her exhibit, Turquoise, Sky, and Water. She wanted to do an exhibit on turquoise, but she didn't know a lot about jewelry. I was somewhat knowledgeable about the subject. So we got together to do the exhibit and to co-write the exhibit catalog. It was while I was doing research about the objects for the exhibit that I came across H.P. Mara and the pieces he had collected. I was fascinated by the detailed records he kept about each piece, the dates of purchase, where he bought them, and how much he paid. As I currently work with the collections in the museum, I was also familiar with the strength of our jewelry collection, which is pre-1940 pieces, and learned that the items collected by Mara formed the foundation of that collection. It was then that I began thinking that these beautiful pieces should be shown. They had never been shown before, along with the detailed documentation that Mara provided. The opportunity came when we needed an exhibit to fill in between two pottery exhibits with something that wouldn't be affected by the construction going on behind us for the new here, now, and always permanent this exhibit. So in the fall of 1932, Harry Mara made a trip to the Navajo Nation to collect jewelry for the Laboratory of Anthropology. The trip was funded by John D. Rockefeller Jr., who, along with many anthropologists at the time, mistakenly felt that the Navajo ways of life and their material culture would soon disappear. And there was an urgency to collect objects before they were all gone. In a letter to Rockefeller from Jesse Nussbaum, the director of the lab, he said he chose Mira for the job because he was an affable, friendly guy who would get along well with the traders and the Navajo people he would meet along the way. Nussbaum hired David Neumann, a dealer in Navajo jewelry and other native arts, who was very familiar with the Navajo reservation. Neumann acted as a guide and driver for the trip. They covered over 2,500 miles and visited 79 trading posts on or near the reservation. Mira's goal was to obtain pieces that would show the development of Navajo jewelry from the simplest forms to the more complex. In addition, he wanted to find examples of various styles and techniques, such as wrought silver, casting, wire work, stone setting, and applied decoration. The jewelry he collected dates from about 1880 to 1930. Many were made from silver coins or silver slugs that were turned into ingots and were either wrought or melted, poured into molds, and cast. The pieces mostly were made before advanced tools, and mechanical devices were widely unavailable at, at the time. In addition, there were a few references the jewelers, there were few references the jewelers had for styles and techniques. They were able to come up with the beautiful jewelry they made, shows how creative and artistic these silversmiths were. Their designs and the techniques they developed form the basis and inspiration for the generations of jewelers that have followed.
A little about Harry Mira himself. Mira was a medical doctor. He practiced first in Detroit and then in Kansas, but he was always fascinated by archeology, span particularly of the Southwest. And he made many trips out here during his tenure as a physician. He eventually settled in Santa Fe, where he served as the county health officer, all the while pursuing his interest in archeology. span In 1926, he was one of the founders of the Indian Arts Fund, whose purpose was the collection of Southwest material culture. Mira continued systematically cataloging archeological sites in the Southwest, which he continued doing once becoming curator of archeology span at the lab. Eventually, he and his assistants and students discovered over 2,000 sites, and he developed a registration system of archeological sites that's still used today by anthropologists. Most of the pieces that Mara bought were dead pawn. And I'd like to talk a little bit about pawn and trading posts. In the early 30s, there were more than 150 trading posts on or near the Navajo Nation. The posts served many purposes, community centers, post offices, and general stores. Traders themselves often settled disputes, loaned materials and money, and provided shelter to families who traveled long distances to come to the post. Many of the traders learned the Navajo language for better rapport with their customers, and many actually married into Navajo families. Transactions between the people and the trader were by barter. Traders extended credit through pawn. Typically, pawn was redeemed twice a year, after the spring wool clip and after the sale of lambs in the fall. If not redeemed at the agreed upon time, the jewelry became dead pawn and it could be sold. However, most traders held onto the pawned items for extended periods of time gaining trust in the community, and also avoiding conflict. Of course, there were bad actors as well among the traders. Those who charged high interest rates or would sell the pawned items as soon as the time expired without notifying the owner in advance they charge extremely high prices for the necessities, taking advantage of their customers who were locked into the pawn and credit pricing structure. As I said, most of what Mara purchased was dead pawn. And if he saw an item that he wanted, but was still in pawn, the trader would ask the owner if he wanted to sell. Sometimes the answer was yes, other times no. Moving on to the objects themselves, here in the first case are two rings with curved wire work that are interesting because the Pueblos had much more exposure at the time to the Spanish population than did the Navajo. As a result, the Pueblo jewelers sometimes tried to imitate some of the jewelry styles they saw the Spanish women wearing. In this case, the rings could have been made by Zuni smiths who were trying to imitate and emulate the filigree work common in Spanish jewelry.
The silver beads in the necklace, like those in all the necklaces in the exhibit, were made in two halves. Each half was drilled from the inside, and then the two halves were soldered together. So, a way to tell an old handmade bead is to look for a slight outward flange around the hole. Modern beads are drilled from the outside and don't have this flange. In case two, the bracelet, object number one in this case, has Persian turquoise. Around the turn of the century, when American turquoise was still scarce, Lorenzo Hubble, who had a trading post in Ganado, Arizona, imported pre-cut Persian turquoise and distributed it to the jewelers in his area. At the time, there were only a handful of turquoise mines, such as Cerrillos, Hachita in southern New Mexico, and Manassa in southern Colorado. Once mined by Native Americans, they now are owned by Anglos and weren't being exploited for turquoise to any great extent. It wasn't until turquoise mining took hold in Nevada that the stone became more available. Number three was purchased at the Clagato Trading Post. And there's kind of a funny story about something that happened there. In 1935, Winnie Balcom, one of the owners of the Kintil Post, which was about 15 miles away, thought that the Clagato was selling the flat, their flower cheaper than she was. And she thought this was unfair competition. So she charged into the Clagato Post with literally guns blazing and shot up the place. Later, she found out that it wasn't true about the flower price, and she apologized. No big deal to her, I guess. The left and the center are relatively older pieces, and characteristic of older pieces, they have high handmade bezels that were made before thin sheet silver was available for that purpose. The one on the left has flat stones. That's also a characteristic of older pieces. Object number five is also an early piece because the decoration around the edges was made with the edge of a file, not with a pre-made stamp. Mara thought the stone was added later and it is an ear bob which is an eardrop, usually a slab of turquoise attached to the ear at one time with string and later with silver wire. Often early pieces used beads or ear bobs for the turquoise setting. The turquoise beads and earrings were probably traded for with Santo Domingo. This four, object number five, is a cast piece with a particularly sophisticated design. However, there are several breaks that show in the back. These resulted from faulty annealing of the silver. The bracelet wasn't heated enough when the jeweler tried to bend it into shape. At the time, the jeweler was probably using a bellows to heat up his fire and couldn't get it quite hot enough. Later, gas blowtorches has solved that problem. The pin, number 11, is also possibly an early Zuni piece, as drops, also from Spanish inspiration, became a common Zuni design motif. In case five, there's two rings in the center top that are set with garnet stones. These are both older rings done, again, when turquoise was hard to come by. So, when older pieces like these 
sometimes garnets were used. And it's interesting where the garnets came from. Ant hills. When ants on the reservation dig up their tunnels, they throw out the dirt to make a hill, of course. Sometimes in these hills, one could find garnets that the ants threw out with the dirt. And as a result, the Navajos used quite a few garnets in their old pieces. In case number six, object number one is an older bracelet set with turquoise. Many historians feel that the first turquoise set in silver was done by Atsidi Chan, one of the first Navajo silversmiths. Number two came from the Red Lake Trading Post. And the building was stone on the first floor, and the top story was made from Arbuckle coffee crates. There's another sort of funny story about this post. The area around the post was rife with rattlesnakes. And of course, the owners were trying to get rid of as many as they could. The wife of the owner used to make tuna sandwiches for tourists and guests that visited. There was a twist, however. The tuna was actually rattlesnake meat. Number four, in this case, is an old piece made with rudimentary tools. The horizontal lines were gouged out with a chisel, and the dots in the center were made with the point of a broken file. Number six, comes from the Goulding Trading Post, located in Monument Valley, Utah. There's an interesting story about the owner of the post. Because he was located in a somewhat remote location, he wanted to do something to encourage some tourist traffic. And he came up with the idea to take pictures of the surrounding Monument Valley area and bring them to the famous Hollywood director, John Ford, in order to encourage him to film one of his movies in the area. He actually succeeded, and Ford wound up filming Stagecoach, starring John Wayne near the post. And some of the actors and crew stayed at the post. Ford went on to make several movies and Monument Valley. Item number eight is a squash blossom necklace. And squash blossom necklaces consist of a pendant called a nadra. The crescent-shaped design originated from the same style ornament on Spanish horse bridles. The Spanish, in turn, learned of the nadra shape from the Iberian Muslims for whom it was a protective symbol. The squash blossom shaped ornaments also came from the Spanish. In this case, the pomegranate ornaments that the men wore on their clothing. The Navajo elongated the flower petals to resemble a squash blossom, which they were more familiar with. This necklace in particular, still has ornaments that look like pomegranates, whereas object number nine has a more elongated squash blossom-like ornaments. Item number 11 is a cluster design in this ring, which became a common Zuni design. This could be a Zuni-made ring, the cluster design, however, became very popular among Navajo women, and cluster jewelry was traded for and eventually made by Navajo jewelers to meet the demand. In case eight, item number six came from the Hubble Trading Post. In general, Lorenzo Hubble was an important figure to Navajo jewelry. I mentioned before that he imported turquoise from Persia. In addition to that, he made a point of bringing the most up-to-date tools and equipment to the smiths in his area. 
As a result, early jewelry that came from around the Ganado area was often more refined than what was coming from other parts of the reservation. In case nine, number two was a child's bracelet. It was important for the Navajo to give turquoise jewelry to their children because turquoise was considered protective and to bring good luck and wealth. Number four and five are interesting because these bracelets had a similar look, but they were made by two completely different techniques. The one on the left was cast in one piece, whereas the other one was made by soldering eight wires together to come up with the same appearance. They both have an applied decoration in the center, which is holding the turquoise. In case 10, we show a group of concha belts. And concha belts have a dual origin. One inspiration was the plain silver disc belt made by some of the Plains tribes. The other was ornamentation on the bridle, the conchos, that were worn on Spanish horses. And from the Spanish conchos came the scalloped edge, the punched holes, and the file mark decoration. In case 11, Number seven is a bracelet with twisted wire. And twisted wire began to be used in the late 19th century. Thick wire, as in this piece, was hand forged, and thinner wire was made using a draw plate, which is a hardened steel plate with holes of multiple diameters through which wire is drawn in order to size it. Number eight, again, displays a cluster arrangement, which became a common Zuni motif. And this bracelet could be either Navajo or Zuni made. It's hard to tell. In case 12, number five, here again, we see the use of an ear bob as the turquoise setting. In case 13, number three, and number four, these bracelets use Persian turquoise, which can be identified by the high domes of the cabochons. The design of number three was one associated with a jeweler named Juan de Dios of Zuni Pueblo, and it's possible that this was even made by him. Number seven in case 14, is a tobacco, tobacco flask. And the tobacco flask was copied from the water canteens used by the soldiers at the time. It was difficult to make, matching the two halves perfectly and then soldering it all the way around. Few were made. In case 15, number five, the bridle was made by Etsidi Chan whom I mentioned before, and consequently is one of the most important pieces in our collection. As mentioned earlier, he's thought to be the first to set turquoise into silver. He's also thought to be, to have made the first concho belt. He traded with the Zuni and knew them well, and eventually he moved there and taught silversmithing to the first Zuni smith named Lanyadi. Lanyadi went on to teach silversmithing to the Hopi. So Atsidi Shan was also a teacher of slender maker of silver, whose image we used in the banner for this exhibit. Case 16, object number five is a first phase concho belt probably made from silver coins, melted into an ingot, and then pounded out. Sometimes you can tell ingot silver 
from the fine cracks that appear on the surface. These result from the pounding of the silver. These early conchos were made with an open space in the center to wind the leather belt through. As the jewelers became more adept at soldering, though, they put copper loops on the back of each concho and wound the belt through them, allowing for a solid concho without the cutout in the center. This is called the second phase, and the third phase belts uh, were named when turquoise was added. In case 17, I show examples of the pawn tickets used by the traders. You'll notice there isn't a lot of information on them. And that's because the traders typically knew their customers well and didn't need to know detailed information about them. They'll just have a name or even a nickname. Well, Thanks to Harry Mara and his charm, perseverance, and good taste, the museum has an important group of early Southwest jewelry, which forms the foundation of its jewelry collection. I'm glad for the opportunity to bring these amazing objects out of the basement and to put them on display so that you can see the creative artistry of these early silversmiths and understand where the jewelry of today comes from. Well, thank you. And if you have any questions, we'll have a Q&A coming up shortly. Thanks.